This episode of Paradigm Profiles profiles one of the leaders of the Nuestra Familia prison organization, Sheldon Skip Villanueva. To date, Skip is one of the NF's most influential leaders who has not only risen to the top of the organization during the course of the last 30 years, but he has also exhibited an unyielding level of loyalty that has proven to be unshakable. Skip's just one of a handful of NF leaders who was considered not only one of the most loyal, but he's also one of the most recognized names within the organization. Over the years, he's just become a household name out there, said one former NF member who chose not to be identified. Skip, who for a short time lived in San Francisco's Presidio District, moved to San Jose, California with his mom and sister when he was nine. Although Skip's father wasn't around during most of his upbringing, his mother was an extremely hard worker and she did everything she could to provide a good life for Skip and his sister. There were times when she worked two jobs just so she could put them through school and give them the kind of upbringing they needed in order to prosper in life. During the 70s when Skip was in his teens, he began hanging around with other troubled kids his age and eventually got involved in gangs. This was something Skip's mom emphatically tried to avoid, but moving the family into a nice three bedroom house located on the east side of San Jose put Skip right in the middle of a gang problem that was just beginning to develop. Back in the 70s, the local street gangs weren't really identifying with being Northanios yet. They were just regular street gangs that claimed different streets in different parts of San Jose's metropolitan neighborhoods. Believe it or not, back in the 70s, gangs were a lot different than they are these days. The Hells Angels motorcycle gang was one of the most feared gangs back then, and a lot of the younger generation became deeply involved in the whole political revolutionary movement. Groups like the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets were dominant forces in those days. Despite the fact that Skip's mom did all she could to keep him out of trouble, Skip started committing crimes when he was in his early teens and was eventually sent to CYA, California Youth Authority. After doing several years in CYA, Skip continued to get in trouble and eventually ended up going to state prison. At the age of 19, Skip was sent to state prison for his first bid. It was then when he began making decisions that would literally have a long-term effect on what direction his life would go in from that point on. During Skip's first term, he started running with members and associates of the Nuestra Familia. Back in those days, you either became a loyal believer of the Mexican Mafia, a loyal believer of the Nuestra Familia, or you remained unaffiliated and were one of the many who became susceptible to becoming a victim. Skip chose the Nuestra Familia. It wasn't just the philosophy and the NS propaganda that Skip bought into, but by the time he was approached about being recruited, the geographical lines were just starting to become physical and the recruiting practices of both groups had almost become exclusive. The Mexican Mafia laid claim to Southern California as its formal recruiting grounds, and the Nuestra Familia laid claim to Northern California as its formal recruiting grounds. Skip was always a skinny kid growing up and this didn't change as he got older. He was about 6'1", but his weight never exceeded 180 pounds. But even though Skip was a skinny guy, he was always known for being extremely violent and for just being a troublemaker, said another former NF member who also chose not to be identified. I remember when Skip was still a new recruit and had just been married into the organization. Married is a term. NF members used to describe the act of recruitment. He stabbed an AB member and an MF sympathizer both within a few days of each other. He impressed a lot of the older C's because he had just been brought in and already was putting in work, said the former member. After Skip parole for the first time, he started running around with one of his best friends, Robert Ponyboy Maris, who he had known since they were kids. Ponyboy introduced him to two brothers, John and James Blanco, who were two of the biggest PCP suppliers in Northern California. At the time, John Blanco was supplying Ponyboy with large amounts of PCP and Pony basically had from San Jose to San Francisco sold up. Because they were close friends, Ponyboy cut Skip in on some of the action and together they began making a lot of money. Pony would have cut Skip in on the action either way because that was his boy, but Pony knew that Skip's status as a member of the NF had the potential to open up a lot of doors and that they could in turn help the organization by networking. And that's exactly what they did. 
John and James Blanco began working almost exclusively with the NF and some of its associates. For a while, they were bringing in a lot of money and there wasn't much competition out there. But then in the early 90s, they started encountering all kinds of problems. Following a few incidents that led to people close to John Blanco getting arrested, John Blanco suspected Tony Little Weasel Herrera of being an informant and for being the one who was providing information to the police. In fact, it was later discovered that Herrera was a confidential informant and Herrera would later end up giving information to the cops that resulted in Skip's arrest. At the time all this was just beginning to develop, a large number of NF members began to parole from state prison. This ended up being a coincidence, but one by one they began to hit the streets. One of the first ones to get out was an NF member by the name of Louis Dump Truck Chavez. Dump Truck paroled from Tehachapi with a hit list of NF dropouts and NF hermits that was comprised by then leaders Pablo Pantera Pena from San Jose and Joseph Pinky Hernandez from Cucamonga. Dump Truck was supposed to take the hit list out to the streets with him and hand deliver it to other NF members that were either out of custody or who were set to be released soon after him. But instead of following the directives that Pantera and Pinky gave him, Dump Truck had plans of his own. When Dump Truck went to the parole office in San Jose to make his initial contact with his parole officer, he ended up giving the hit list to his parole officer and advised him of the directives he was given by Pinky and Pantera. Dump Truck's parole officer told him to just continue to act like you normally would and try to gather as much information as you can. So for the next couple of months, Dump Truck continued to gather as much information about the San Jose Regiment as he could. Meanwhile, several other high-ranking NF members began paroling one by one. Ronald Lucky Shelton was one of the first to get out, and then Bobby Silencio Lopez, Herminio Spanquillo Serna, James Webel Trujique, Cripple Jerry Salazar, and others would soon follow. After Skip was arrested, a meeting was held in November of 1990 by Shelton, Lopez, and Trujique to discuss what their plans were going to be for Tony Little Weasel Herrera due to him being suspected of being an informant. Shelton decided that they were going to kill Herrera, but Shelton then said he personally handled the assignment to set an example as head RSD, Regimental Security Department. Skip, who was a lieutenant at the time, agrees to assist Lucky with the hit. However, the following day, Little Weasel provides information to the police, which ultimately leads to Skip's arrest. Little Weasel provided the information discreetly, but by now, Lucky and Silent were already convinced that he had something to do with it. The following day, Shelton shot Herrera eight times in the head and neck and left his body in the middle of the street on Wooster Avenue. On the day Little Weasel was murdered, he agreed to meet Lucky, Webber, and Silent to discuss some of the street activities he was assisting the regiment with. When Lucky, Silent, and Webber pulled up in a Chevette that belonged to Betsy Spencer, Little Weasel was told to get in the car. Once in the car, Webber pulled out a 38 caliber revolver, aimed it at him, and pulled the trigger twice. But the gun supposedly jammed. Realizing that Webber had just tried to shoot him, Little Weasel got out of the car and tried to run. Silent then jumped out, ran after him, and tackled him in the middle of the street. While he was still down, Lucky then walked up and shot him eight times in the neck and head. This prompted a coded message sent to Pinky and some of the other leaders in Pelican Bay. Little Weasel is peddling daisies. Over the next year and a half, several other murders were committed on the streets of San Jose until law enforcement authorities had seen enough. It was clear that there was an escalation of murders that had been committed by members and associates of the San Jose Street Regiment, and bodies were literally popping up everywhere. By this time, Dump Truck had already gone into hiding, fearing that he was going to be targeted and killed. As law enforcement authorities began to comprise their own hit list of NF members and associates that they were about to arrest, they received a blessing in October of 1991. Louis Dump Truck Chavez agrees to cooperate with authorities and testify in front of an impaneled grand jury detailing all the murders and illicit activities that the San Jose Regiment was involved in. On October 2, 1992, 21 Western Familia members and associates are indicted by a Santa Clara County grand jury in connection to several murders and all the regiment activities on the streets of San Jose. Those indicted were 
Vincent Chante Royal, Santos Bad Boy Bernius, Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes, Liano Leocano, Anthony Chico Guzman, Joseph Pinky Hernandez, Timothy Timo Hernandez, Bobby Silent Lopez, Alice Perez Lamelin, Carlos Cusano Mendoza, Irene Yeto, Raul Roy Rivles, Jerry Cripple Jerry Salazar, Herminio Spanquillo Cerna, Ronald Lucky Shelton, Martin Cerna, Carmen Trinidad, James Huevo Trujique, Eddie Flaco Vargas, Sheldon Skip Villanueva, and Celeste Williams. On June 2nd, 1994, a little over a year after the first indictment, law enforcement stepped up the pressure by unsealing a second wave of indictments on seven more NF members and associates. Those indicted in the second wave were Vincent Chente Arroyo, Carlos Gusano Mendoza, Adam Bandit Karras, Deborah Mendoza, Luis Olivares Jr., Guadalupe Mary Segura, and Jeanette Alarcon. Most of the defendants in the first and second indictments ended up pleading out. However, the final three received the death penalty and were sent to San Quentin's death row. Skip was one of the first ones to plead out and jump on a 14 year deal. For the next eight to nine years, Skip would be housed in the shoe program in Pelican Bay. During this time, he continued to elevate himself within the NF's leadership structure and was eventually voted in as a category three. At one point during the mid to late 90s, he was appointed to hold the RSD position under the old leadership structure, and then he would later be voted in as part of the inner council and a liaison to the RSG, Regimental Street General. For the next decade, Skip would become deeply involved in the leadership street affairs and personally facilitated directives that resulted in him being indicted in one of the biggest and most expensive federal RICO indictments to date. Between 2001 and 2002, Operation Black Widow was a five-year multi-million dollar federal investigation that was unsealed on 22 members and associates of the Nuestra Familia. The federal government's purpose for unleashing this indictment was in essence to break the organization's leadership by indicting the group's leaders, convicting them, and then having their state sentences commuted so that the defendants could be dispersed to different federal USPs throughout the country. When Operation Black Widow broke, the principal figures that included Joseph Pinky Hernandez, Cornelio Corny Tristan, Gerald Cuete Rubacaba, Tex Marin Hernandez, Daniel Stork Perez, Sheldon Skip Villanueva, and James Tibbs Morado were all housed in the shoe at Pelican Bay. The following day, they were all transported to the Santa Rita County Jail in Dublin, California so that they could be arraigned on federal charges. The rest of those who were charged in the indictment were either already in custody at various county jails or they were picked up and arrested on federal warrants. Sometimes towards the end of 2002 or in the beginning of 2003, the principal figures were all moved to the Glenn Dyer Detention Facility in Oakland, California. The case went on for close to five years and in the end, most if not all of the defendants ended up taking deals or pleading out. Coincidentally, Skip was one of the first ones to take another 14 year deal and go just like he did when he was indicted almost 10 years earlier in the 1992 Santa Clara County indictments. By the time Skip left the federal detention facility, he had firmly established himself as one of the top leaders in the NF. And there was no question in anyone's mind as to Skip's loyalty to the organization. He'd proven over and over that it was unshakable and that he had completely dedicated his life to his beliefs. When Skip hit the federal prison system, it didn't take long for him to revert back to some of his old ways. It seemed like every USP he was sent to, he was either responsible for kicking off a riot or was locked up for picking up another stabbing. One of the first federal penitentiaries he was sent to was Atwater. He stayed in that water for a couple months before he ended up kicking off a riot between the Norteños and the Sureños. Later, he would get transferred to Lewisburg in Pennsylvania, where he was suspected of stabbing a Norteño dropout. In 2008, he was transferred to Florence in Colorado, where he was responsible for kicking off another riot that included about 30 Norteños and Sureños. 
By this time, Skip's name was ringing all over the federal system and he was picking up a bad reputation for being a troublemaker. After just having turned 50, he was now being referred to as Grandpa Skip or Gramps. Although the NF forbids its members from promoting the gangbang mentality, Skip was always the kind of C who seemed to look for a reason to start shit with the Sureños, and that's what he continued to do. While Skip was in Florence, incident took place between a northerner and a southerner. The southerner apparently disrespected the northerner somehow, and Skip basically made sure that there would be no way possible that it would get worked out or squashed. Before Skip caught word of it, the northerner and southerner talked it out and came to some kind of resolution about it. At that point, it should have been a dead issue. But when Skip heard about it, he apparently went to one of the more influential southerners and told him that he wanted the southerner in question to come apologize to his homeboy, or otherwise, he was going to have to leave the yard. Everybody knew that this just wasn't going to happen. Skip surely had to even know that this wasn't going to happen himself, but yet, this was the line he was pushing. Anyone who knows anything about prison politics knows that there's no way that someone's going to bow down and apologize to an adversary like that. Not under those circumstances. How can you say face after that? That would have just been considered an act of weakness, and I'm sure Skip knew he was forcing the issue. Needless to say, there was no apology, so the fight was on. But Skip had already anticipated this and had numerous Northanians on the yard strapped up and ready to go. Under Skip's orders, they took flight and started attacking all the Sureños on the yard. The Sureños never even had a chance to retrieve their weapons, but they fought back and this turned into a pretty big riot. This incident resulted in Skip getting transferred to Pollock Federal Prison in Louisiana. The one thing that's good about the feds is they have no shoe programs. You can get sent to a supermax for a stabbing or an assault for a specific amount of time, but it's for a determined amount of time. Skip would find this out soon, but before they locked him up, he still had one more order of business that he would get to first. In January 2008, not long after arriving at Paula, Skip stabbed and killed an individual by the name of Pete Gutierrez. Skip received information from one of his contacts that Gutierrez was not only a Northaniel dropout, but he had also been convicted of child molestation. Skip could have sent another Northerner to hit this guy, Gutierrez, but Skip wanted to set an example to some of the other Northerners that he wasn't the type of leader who just sat back and gave orders. The day Skip committed the stabbing, he planned the entire incident out and made sure that the unsuspecting Gutierrez was caught completely off guard. Between one of the facility's unlocks, Skip hid and waited by a staircase that was kitty corner to Gutierrez' cell. When Gutierrez came out of his cell for the unlock, Skip was on him before he even knew what hit him. The first three hits were done in the front of Gutierrez' neck with such precision that Gutierrez' spinal cord was ruptured and he was basically incapacitated from that point on. As Gutierrez laid on his back, Unable to fend off the attack or move, Skip stood over him and continued to sink the piece of steel into his neck, eyes, face, and head. Over and over, he just kept aiming the weapon in a deadly methodic circle from neck, eyes, face, and head. Meanwhile, as Skip continued what was sure to be a murder, he was conscious of the prison's day room cameras, but this had no effect on him as he just acted like the cameras weren't even there. Once Gutierrez's face became an unrecognizable bloody mess of holes, minced flesh, and brain matter, he then took the weapon and started sinking it in an area that he was sure was right above the heart. Again, as the cameras caught the entire incident from beginning to end, he continued to stab Gutierrez until he was so tired that he had to switch hands. Once Skip was sure that Gutierrez was dead, he began to walk away. The camera footage shows Skip walk about 10 feet, stop, and then go back and continue to stab Gutierrez in the neck and head again. Later when Skip openly talked about why he killed Gutierrez, he stated that he killed him because he was a child molester and that he just can't stand to be around that kind of trash. When Skip recounted the details of the murder, he stated that he thought he was dead after stabbing him the first time, but he said that as he was walking away, he seen Gutierrez move out of his peripheral, so he went back to make sure that the job was finished. In all actuality, 
Gutierrez was probably in fact dead after the first barrage of stabbings and the movement that Skip claimed he seen was probably nothing more than Gutierrez's body convulsing or the nerves going through their death throes. Following this incident, Skip was charged with the federal death penalty for the underlying special circumstances of lying in wait and for premeditation. The case took almost six years to litigate because it was a death penalty case and because the predicate offenses the federal prosecutor used were the offenses Skip was charged with in Operation Black Widow, which had a massive amount of evidence to go through, and then the 1992 indictments the first time Skip was indicted. To litigate this case, Skip got lucky and ended up with a highly prominent team of seasoned lawyers. The lawyers put on a masterful defense claiming that Skip had developed sensory deprivation syndrome in the shoe and that he basically grew cold in the shoe due to the lack of human contact and human interaction. In the end, Skip dodged the death penalty and was sentenced to life in federal prison. This also got Grandpa Skip a plane ticket to ADX Supermax in Florence, Colorado, where he was eventually reunited with Corny, Pinky, Cuete, Tex, and Tibbs. Before Operation Black Widow broke, there wasn't too much attention on the NF presence that were functioning within the federal prison system. There were a number of older NF members there, such as Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes from Stockton, Hector Copas Gallegos from Salinas, Marcus Tarzan Castaneda from Pomona 12th Street Sharkies, and a few others. When the former leadership from Operation Black Widow hit the federal system, a lot more attention was focused on the NF and their activities in the federal prison system. Although the federal government intended for this case to break the NF's leadership structure and to throw the organization off balance for a little while, it actually had the opposite effect. Corny, Cuete, Tibbs, Pinky, Skip, and Tex are recruiting machines and they didn't waste any time tapping into the federal pool of willing participants. The feds assumed that this would slow down the organization and hinder the NF's activities in California, but that didn't happen. In fact, this created a power vacuum where the NF and Pelican Bay quickly reorganized itself under a new branch of leadership and it also enabled the NF to expand and metastasize outside of California, the same way the MA was able to do. The NF spread quickly like a nomadic epidemic with new regiments popping up all over the country. Law enforcement discovered street regiments popping up in places like Colorado, Utah, Kansas City, New Mexico, Washington, Arizona, etc, etc. Until recently, the federal system was being ran by Andrew Mad Dog Cervantes and Marcus Tarzan Castaneda. However, Tarzan just recently passed away in federal custody, so it's going to be interesting to see how they structure the new leadership. Skip's closest friend, Robert Ponyboy Maris, also just recently passed away after paroling and suffering a drug overdose soon after. In November 1967, Marcus Tarzan Castaneda from Pomona 12th Street Sharkies was stabbed by an MA associate. The shank was very weak. Tarzan went on to become a prolific bank robber in the 1970s and spent the rest of his life in the federal BOP. It is interesting that most P-12 Sharkies sided with the MA by 1980 and several P-12 members rose to become MA members. But in the 1960s, 70s, the lines between the North and South were not clearly drawn yet. Castaneda was from the old school and remained a loyal member of the Nuestra Familia until his death in 2020. One of the other NF cases that sent an influx of high-ranking NF members into the federal prison system was Operation Valley Star. Larry Paki Amaro, Robert Bubba Hanrahan, Albert Bird Larris, Geraldo Reggae Mora, and Ernest Powder Killinger were just a few. Operation Knockout, Tap Out, Crimson Tide, and Red Zone were a few other indictment investigations that sent Sean Bubbles Cameron, Martin Cyclone Montoya, Armin Bandit Valle, and Philip Sharkey Sparks to the federal custody as well. Vidal Spider Favela was another Operation Black Widow defendant as well. As of today, Skip is still housed in ADX Supermax in Florence, Colorado with the rest of the former leadership. Recently, Paradigm Media News has been releasing phone calls made from Skip and the others that are housed in ADX. Just keep in mind that during the time frame that the majority of these calls were made, 
There was a major power struggle going on between the federal branch of the NF and the state. At this time, the state faction had basically just cut off all their resources and they were no longer being allowed to have any say or authority in the California street regiments. That's why these guys sound like they were doing bad, begging for money, newspapers, and for whatever other kinds of crumbs they could get. Today, these guys are flourishing and they have tapped into the financial resources that they've been able to establish in some of the other states. Paradigm, Paradigm Media News will be releasing hundreds of phone calls and visits all the way up until current times. So you guys will get to listen firsthand how they've been able to expand and break new ground in other states. In closing, this profile is being dedicated to Marcus Tarzan Castaneda due to his passing. However, in the very near future, Paradigm Media News plans on doing a profile on Tarzan himself. Thank you.